Uh, bonjour à tous, uh, bienvenue, hello. Uh, this press conference is in the Sir John A. Macdonald Building in Ottawa. It is Thursday, January 27th. I'm Greg Quinn with Market News International. With us today for this update on COVID in Indigenous communities are uh, the Honourable Patty Haidu, Minister of Indigenous Services, Dr. Evan Adams, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Public Health, Patrick Boucher, Senior Assistant Deputy Minister of the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch. Alors avec nous aujourd'hui, l'honorable. With us today, we have the Honourable Patty Haidu, Minister of Indigenous Services Canada, Dr. Evan Adams, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Public Health, and Patrick Boucher, Senior Assistant Deputy Minister of the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch. I will remind everyone to stick to best practices to minimize outside noise. Secondly, the minister is due to leave at 3 p.m. sharp. Uh, last, uh, please identify yourself and your media outlet when asking a question. Um, I'm, I've been told uh, we now have until 3.05 with the minister. Uh, don't, uh, minister Haidu va partir. So, Minister Haidu must leave at 3.05, and we would ask uh, journalists to use a microphone or a landline if possible and to avoid using speaker mode when asking questions. Let's begin with some opening statements and then questions and follow-ups, please. Uh, Minister, please begin. Thank you very much, Kwekwe, Uluku, Tanzi, hello, bonjour. I'm here today on the traditional territory of the Fort William First Nation, with it, which is within the Robinson Superior Treaty territory area, and of course many contributions by Métis people over the generations. And uh, thank you again for joining us this week. I am joined by Dr. Adams, who is the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Public Health, and Patrick Boucher, Senior Assistant Deputy Minister of the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch. We'll provide a brief update and then we'll be available for questions. First, I want to acknowledge the profoundly sad news shared early this week by Williams Lake First Nation. Our thoughts are with the community and, of course, everyone who's been affected by uh, this very, very difficult finding. As my colleague, Minister Miller, has said many times, the horrific acts committed in residential schools are not news to Indigenous peoples. As we acknowledge the ongoing discovery and these shameful truths as part of our history, we remain committed to supporting those who have suffered, listen to leadership and survivors, and supporting the difficult work of finding and commemorating those missing children. If you are a residential school survivor or you know someone who is in need of crisis services, please, please let them know that help is available through the National Crisis Line at one 866 925-4419. Yesterday, I was pleased to share alongside my colleagues, Minister Miller and Minister Lametti, that the federal government has now withdrawn its judicial review before the federal court regarding the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal order on funding for capital assets as it relates to First Nations Child and Family Services and Jordan's Principal Services. I want to thank all of the parties at the table that have been working so hard together so that we have a common understanding of the orders and we can agree to that common understanding. As I've said many times, litigation is in no one's interest. And so this is a positive step forward. It's one more piece removed from court processes that helps us remain focused on implementing the long-term reforms and the supports that truly will change the reality for so many Indigenous First Nations children and their families. Today on COVID, we have a little bit of space for cautious optimism this week. The number of active outbreaks in Indigenous communities is decreasing slightly. Active cases accounts we are hopeful are reaching their peak and I know that so many people are exhausted and have been working so hard to protect each other. I sincerely hope we're starting to shift to the backside of this most recent wave. But it is a reminder that we all have to stay vigilant and keep doing what we're doing, protecting each other, protecting our own health, protecting our communities, stepping up to help each other, and of course, taking care of each other in this really challenging time. 
Vaccines continue to show us that they are one of the most effective tools to preventing serious health outcomes and death. So please continue to book your next shots or boosters if it's your time and you haven't already done so. And for uh, people uh, in your circles and your families, continue to have those important conversations about how vaccines can reduce risk of death, reduce risk of hospitalization, keep families intact. For First Nations and Inuit, if travel is needed for vaccination, it will be covered by the non-insured health benefits. The number of déclosions actives dans la collectivité autochtone diminue légèrement, and nous espérons que le number de cas actifs atteindra son sommet. J'ai bon espoir, comme bien d'autres, j'en suis sûr, que nous allons peut-être commencer à tourner la page sur cette récente vague. Cependant, nous devons tout rester vigilants et continuer de faire ce que nous faisons, protéger notre propre santé, la santé de ceux que nous entourons, nos, 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 nos communautés et nos systèmes de soins de santé. Les vaccins continuent de nous montrer qu'ils sont l'un des outils les plus efficaces pour prévenir les conséquences graves pour la santé et les décès. Alors, si vous ne l'avez pas déjà fait, veuillez continuer de prendre rendez-vous pour vos prochains vaccins ou vos vaccins de rappel. Dans le cas de Premières Nations et des Inuits, si des déplacements sont nécessaires pour la vaccination, ils seront couverts par le, les services de santé non assurés. And as we've provided updates in recent weeks, we continue to work directly with communities to help prepare and, for and respond to outbreaks. More detail is available in our accompanying news re release for this week's update, but I do want to point out some of the great work being done with partners across the country, including a new app that's being developed by the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, FSIN, to help build vaccine confidence. The Talking Stick app, which is expected to launch in the next month or so, is an innovative Indigenous-led app that will provide a platform for First Nations to ask questions about COVID-19 and vaccines. In Alberta, Indigenous Services has been supporting mental wellness town halls on Wind Speaker Radio to feature advice from medical officers of health, mental health support workers, guidance from elders, and more. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs has an ambassador initiative that Indigenous Services is partnering with on to provide Indigenous teams of 8 to 10 people who can provide immediate resource support to First Nations communities in their COVID response. And in six, six Nations of the Grand River, some great and innovative community programs have been happening. This has included a mobile bus vaccination clinic, drive through events to distribute rapid tests and masks, call-in radio shows with medical experts, and recording podcasts with local community members about vaccine hesitancy. These are just some of the great examples from communities across the country doing their part thinking outside of the box. And I want to thank everyone for doing that together, putting together innovative solutions and programs, keeping each other safe. It's still a very challenging time for everyone. But I do hope that we'll see more uh, optimism in the weeks ahead. And I want to thank everyone that has been helping each other, stepping up to be there for each other. This is how we get through this, by supporting each other in these weeks ahead. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over now to Dr. Adams, Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Public Health. Great. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Audrey Schwitt, I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, the unceded territory of Tlaama Nation, my home nation. As of January 25th, two days ago, um, over 1 million doses or a 1.05 million, uh, to be exact, have been administered in First Nations, Inuit, and territorial communities. Of those, over 86% of individuals aged 12 plus have received a second dose. Less than 20% of adults have received a booster dose. And over 43% of individuals aged 5 to 11 have received at least one dose. As of January 26, there are 5,000 509 active cases in First Nations communities. And sadly, there have been a total of 599 fatalities due to COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. 
Indigenous Services Canada continues to work with other federal departments, provinces, territories, and Indigenous partners to provide supports in responding to the pandemic where possible. Following public health measures remains essential in getting through this Omicron wave. An additional step that can be taken is to consider the regional context on top of provincial and territorial public health measures as local epidemiology changes quickly. Vaccines continue to play a critical role in reducing the risk of serious outcomes, such as hospitalization and admission into the ICU. Receiving the vaccine, whether that be the first or second dose for unvaccinated individuals or a booster dose when eligible, helps to protect family, friends, and communities. Although no single public health measure is 100% effective at preventing COVID-19, we encourage everyone to take a layered approach to help reduce the spread. This means layering the protection provided by getting a complete series of a COVID-19 vaccination with timed and targeted public health measures and individual protective practices such as staying home and or self-isolating if you have symptoms, wearing masks, social distancing, distancing etc. COVID-19 has limited our ability to spend time with loved ones, establish and maintain meaningful connections, as well as travel and the ability to partake in cultural gatherings. This has had a profound impact on the mental health of some, uh, including uh, our communities uh, and our workforces. It is important to reach out uh, to your loved ones and to those at risk, as well as lean on one another for support during these very difficult times. Everyone has a role to play in getting through this current Omicron wave, and our individual actions collectively have a large impact. Let us continue to work together to move forward. Thank you. Merci. Are we ready to move to questions? Yes, we are. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, operator, um, can we have the first question from the phone, please? Première question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Merci. Please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. The first question is from, la première question est de Dylan Robertson, Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead, à vous la parole. Hi there, thanks for holding these briefings. Uh, a question for Dr. Adams. Uh, what do you think is uh, driving the lag in booster shots? Is this just pandemic fatigue or perceived lesser risk, or is it more of a logistical factor because the first two doses were part of a mass you know, deployment with the military involved? Hmm. Uh, I, I think there are probably a few factors that are except that are um, that are uh, affecting uh, the slight lag uh, in booster uptake. Uh, part of it is that uh, we have uh, uh, some younger populations who are slower uh, to get to the booster uh, simply because of the recommendations from uh, NASI and because a large part of our focus at the beginning was on older populations where there is more risk. Uh, I think as well, there is definitely some uh, fatigue um, amongst uh, some of our populations. I, I think that uh, uh, they've been dealing with this for a long time and that uh, perhaps uh, it is uh, a lot of information for them to take in uh, that a third dose uh, has become an eventuality. Um, but I think that uh, our uptake for um, first, second, and third doses uh, has been good, but there's always room for uh, improvement. I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, I'd also like to ask Minister Haidu about the distribution of Paxlovid. 
Uh, last week, uh, you, you probably heard me ask Dr. Wong about what amount Indigenous Services Canada was getting. I just wanted to, to ask if you think it's fair to have it on a per capita basis, um, and, and if you plan to ask for more, just given the heightened vulnerability, the, the, the more severe outcomes that we're seeing in multiple provinces for Indigenous people. Sorry for the pause there, trying to get myself unmuted. Um, I will turn to uh, either Dr. Adams or Patrick Boucher in a moment, but I, I will just say this. Um, obviously, um, many Indigenous people are treated in provincial healthcare systems where they would also have access to Paxlovid. So perhaps uh, I can turn to Patrick Boucher to talk about the um, distribution of the medication and how in particular it might be used in the context of um, uh, in the context uh, that we've received that medication. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Minister, and thank you for the for the question. And, and, and just to start off by saying that, um, you know, we continue to work with provinces and, and territories as, as very important partners to, to allocate the supply uh, equitably uh, across jurisdictions and different segments of, of the population. And that um, collaboration and that continued um, work together is absolutely essential uh, as we go down this this path with with these uh, antivirals. Uh, I will say that allocation principles uh, and interim implementation criteria uh, have been considered in determining uh, the current allocation to remote and isolated First Nation communities in order to optimize um, the limited supply and, and the department uh, will continue to work uh, in uh, with partners uh, in determining how best to manage the allocation as available supply uh, increases in, in the weeks and uh, in months to come. So the department has received their initial allocation of uh, Paxlovid, and, and we're beginning to ship uh, those uh, very precious resources to remote and isolated communities uh, this week to pre-position communities uh, with these uh, treatments. But I'll turn to uh, Dr. Adams uh, to see if he has anything to add on that. Um, yeah, we work very hard to make sure that we have these backup medications. I, I think, uh, of course, uh, being fully vaccinated and uh, being boosted where, where eligible are the best chance that we have. Uh, and even though um, Omicron hasn't, uh, uh, hasn't been giving us uh, as serious uh, outcomes as uh, Delta, of course, is giving us higher volumes. Um, the the availability of um, antiviral medication uh, is a good is a good backup, particularly in remote areas where uh, they may not have the same kinds of tertiary care that happens in urban centers. Uh, I I feel like uh, we've worked really hard to make sure that uh, those uh, backups. Uh, are in place as quickly as possible should they ever be um, needed as long as uh, uh, as well as uh, making sure that we have other kinds of of care uh, i i don't think of uh any uh of these medications as a as a magic bullet it just adds to uh, our toolbox and taking care of populations uh thank you dylan uh, operator uh, next question please Thank question. you. Merci. Once again, please press star 1 if you have a question. De nouveau, n'hésitez pas à appuyer sur étoile 1 pour toute question. The next question is from, la prochaine question est de, Laura Osman, the Canadian Press. Please go ahead, à vous la parole. Uh, good afternoon. I wanted to follow up on the rate of people on First Nations who are boosted. You talked a little bit about some of the, perhaps the vaccine hesitancy, the, the fatigue, um, but I'm wondering if access has been a concern or if anything has changed since the initial rollout of the first two doses of vaccines on First Nations. Maybe I can turn to Dr. Adams for the question. Well, it certainly has been uh, a challenge for us uh, to make sure that uh, the vaccine supply and distribution has been fair and equi equitable and timely. Um, I certainly don't think of uh, access to vaccine as being uh, 
um, much of a factor uh, at all, actually, in uh, third doses for those who are uh, eligible. Uh, I would say that uh, definitely we do need to keep speaking to uh, populations that might be hesitating. Uh, uh, it, it's it's a part of the work. It's definitely a, a part of the work that um, uh, per personally I've, I find uh, a, a bit painful uh, because uh, I, I definitely know that um, getting a third dose is uh, the the best chance that we can give our populations. Uh, and definitely I have been urging our populations to be uh, kind to each other, whether they're vaccinated or not, whether they have one dose, two doses, or three doses, uh, wherever they're at uh, in their uh, vaccinations, uh, we look after each other. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just also wanted to ask about any support for First Nations, um, given that we are at the peak. Is anyone still requesting help? And are you sort of marshalling any support in anticipation of sort of the downward edge of this curve? Uh, maybe I can start and then turn to Patrick for a few details. Um, yes, we're still supporting a number of communities with a number of, of uh, different um, um, assets, whether it's people or resources, um, as as requested and as needed. And certainly announced, as you know, last week, uh, additional monies directly uh, available to First Nations and Indigenous communities that that are are uh, underway right now that are being distributed directly uh, to communities. So they can continue their hard work of uh, protecting community members in whatever way that is most effective. And often uh, they, at, on the ground level, um, know exactly how best to continue that, that protection. Um, but maybe, Patrick, you can speak about some of the communities that are receiving additional supports or the kinds of supports that we're, we're still providing. Absolutely, uh, Minister. And, and, you know, as the Minister said, um, you know, the, the top priority continues to be the, the health and, and, and safety of First Nations, Inuit, and, and Métis peoples across the country. And, and uh, we're committed to supporting communities uh, in their response to COVID-19, making sure that their uh, culturally appropriate responses, community-driven responses uh, to COVID-19, uh, and doing that in, in partnership with uh, Indigenous leadership and, and organizations and provincial and and territorial governments as well, and and many other system partners that we work with uh, on a day in day basis. Um, you know, the the public health advice and 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 guidance uh, related to COVID, as we all know, changes uh, depending on the variants, depending on where the pandemic is going. Um, um, so we need to make sure that we're we're nimble uh, in supporting uh, communities, no matter what the need is, whether it's uh, with vaccination clinics. Uh, whether it's with, um, you know, HHR, human health resource support, uh, whether it's just uh, with humanitarian supports uh, when community members are, are isolating uh, within community to protect uh, their most uh, vulnerable. Uh, and, and now, you know, um, also we're seeing that continued support and the needs related to mental wellness and, and mental health. So making sure that we're taking a holistic approach to supporting communities, being there for communities, uh, having them in the driver's seat and identifying what those gaps are and what those needs are, but then uh, very quickly being there uh, to support them, to partner with them, uh, to make sure that they get the supports that they need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, uh, Let's go to the next question, and I will note I've, I've been told that the minister sh sh could be with us now until quarter after three. Cancer, uh, hello. Thank you for that, um, operator. Next question, prochain question. There are no further questions registered at this time. Nous n'avons plus de questions pour le moment. Uh, would I be able to put one in as moderator, minister? Since we're ahead of schedule. Yes, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. I was. Thank of you. Of course. Um, many Indigenous people don't live in remote communities, but they, they live downtown in, in major cities and they can often be, be hard to reach. Are there any special considerations in providing health care to people who are living in, in those situations? 
Uh, well, thank you for the question. It's a pretty broad one. And I will just say, yes, there are a number of partnerships across the country with Indigenous healthcare providers, and in, indeed, including in, in British Columbia, that has a First Nations health authority. Um, in terms of vaccination, with the vaccine challenge that um, has just been uh, announced, a number of the recipients of um, funding to provide additional awareness and new tools to reach people about uh, the importance of vaccination and getting vaccines to people uh, were Indigenous organizations, were Indigenous community um, supports. And so, um, you know, we work obviously in collaboration with provinces and territories and municipalities um, to support them in, in their jurisdictional obligations to provide health care in an equitable way. But realizing that there are barriers for uh, First Nations, Indigenous people in big cities. And so that's, uh, that's a, a focus that remains a very strong one for us. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, I'd like to see, just put out one last call. Are there any further questions on the phone line? There is one question. Nous avons une question. The question is from la prochaine question est de Laura Osmond, the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Hey there. Sorry to sneak one more in. I just wanted to ask you exactly how many communities you are still in at the moment offering uh, additional support for COVID. I don't have that number, Patrick. Perhaps you do. Well, well, just to say, I mean, it, it's a very um, broad question. Um, you know, throughout the country, our, our regional officers uh, of health, our, our regional offices, uh, are in constant communications with uh, communities. Um, you know, no matter what province uh, or, or territory we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, so there are those, um, you know, ongoing conversations. I don't have an exact number for you, but just to say that it is continuous, depending on the needs that uh, that come up, um, and uh, and uh, and we just want to make sure that we continue to be there for those communities when they do call, when they do need uh, support uh, to address um, their um, you know their their COVID needs within their community. So I don't have a specific number uh, to to give you, but but just to say that uh, it's a pretty much across all communities uh, where we have that continuous. Uh, engagement to make sure that uh, gaps are being filled. All right, thank you. Uh, once again, operator, could we check to see if there are any uh, remaining questions? Yes, the next question is from La Prochaine Question est de Dylan Robertson, Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead, à vous la parole. Hi, I'm also going to sneak one in here uh, for Minister Haidu, just a, a general sort of uh, question about housing. I just wanted to follow up because I know that you said you were going to look into making the national housing strategy uh, work better for Indigenous populations. Could you just give us a bit of an update on, on where things stand, what we might expect uh, as a timeline to hear more about that and, and maybe some of the themes that you're looking at? Oh, well, thank you, Dylan. And in terms of specifics, I I I, uh, I really can't talk to, to today today too too much about that, other than to say that this is a priority that has been raised by almost every Indigenous leader I've spoken to since I've been the minister. Um, and in fact, as we know, housing is a social determinant of health. Uh, what that means is, without good housing, it's very hard to, for example, protect yourself against COVID nineteen, to treat tuberculosis, to prevent and protect other kinds of illnesses. In fact, here in Northern Ontario just released a report about the detrimental effects of poor housing on the health of Indigenous children and their families. So clearly, this is a priority for every leader that I've spoken to across the country. Um, and so, you know, we've uh, uh, obviously committed as a government with a significant investment in renewal of infrastructure and closing the infrastructure gaps on First Nations communities. But I will say that a priority for me is housing. I have certainly stressed that with my colleagues at the cabinet table about the need to be ambitious and bold in the way that we invest in housing on First Nations in partnership with First Nations and Indigenous leaders. This isn't a solution, uh, this isn't a problem that can be solved solely um, by the federal government. Obviously, Indigenous communities have a huge role to play in terms of community planning and infrastructure planning. Um, oftentimes, adding more housing means adding, essentially, effectively, another subdivision, which means 
and additional demands on on water and other other kinds of infrastructure. But I will tell you that across the country, uh, what chiefs and leaders have been telling me is that even despite those challenges, there's room for uh, much more rapid work in affordable and decent housing on First Nations uh, all across the country. Thank you, uh, operator. Uh, if there's, are there any questions of someone we we haven't heard from on on the line? There are no further questions registered at this time. Nous n'avons plus de questions pour le moment. All right. Uh, I would like to ask if uh, Minister or any of our, our doctors would like to have any closing thoughts or comments for us before we close out. And just thank you for being here. Thank you for showing interest um, in Indigenous people in, in this country. It's very, very important that we continue to keep our eye focused on folks that uh, oftentimes through systemic exclusion uh, have some of the biggest challenges in staying healthy. So this is very important that you're covering these stories. Thank you. Thank you very much. That appears to be all we have for today. Uh, thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Bonne journée.